Hello and welcome back to ECE 516. Last day we ended off with the Muse sleep band, the Muse S, and uh, the sleep lab that you, you wear. And now I'll con continue on with the, the overview. Remember this is an overview of all the things that I'm working on, different of my inventions that are kind of related to this course. Not all of them are part of the course, but I want you to sort of see the breadth and depth of what we do. and give me some feedback on some things that you might find of interest. So if there's anything you see here that you find particularly interesting, please let me know in the feedback and I can delve into just about anything here. And again, we're kind of using this sort of authentic MIT Stanford approach to teaching in which, uh, what I learned when I was at MIT was that uh, I learned from the people who actually invented the things that w uh, were being taught. And so it was really great to learn AI from person who invented AI and machine learning, Marvin Minsky, or to learn computer vision from Bertolt Horn, who's the person who invented computer vision. So I want to share with you some of my inventions and ideas and everything. And these are things that I know very deeply and understand very deeply and be, would be delighted to teach. So if there's anything that you'd like to learn about uh, here, please let me know and we can delve right in. So uh, what you see up on the top of the screen is my FNIRS data. This is the Blueberry X brain sensing headband, uh, brain sensing eyeglass that captures the environment, what's happening inside the brain, and it captures the environment, what's happening around us. And it combines the environment with the environment. So it captures what what's our mental state is and, and, uh, and how we're doing. So at the top of the screen, you'll see my brain statistics. So you can kind of see inside my head while I'm lecturing. And then in the lower right, I've got a little picture in picture so that uh, you can see the live camera while I'm going through my slide deck. So here, uh, I want to uh, begin here with a, a, a journey on one of the things that fascinated me about MetaVision. We founded that company, MetaVision, as I mentioned earlier. We raised $75 million. My student Raymond Lowe and I and others, we had a CEO uh, as well, uh, the whole company. And the idea of MetaVision is the vision of vision, sensing sensors and sensing the capacity to sense. So I want to kind of take a moment to talk about how MetaVision came to be. One of the things during my childhood that people used to like to do a lot is video feedback, where you point a television camera at a television screen. And here we see this, this article depiction of a TV camera pointed at a TV screen. Crutchfield wrote a very interesting article about the space-time characteristics of video feedback, where you typically have a television screen that's sitting still, and you walk around or with a camera, put the camera on a tripod and point it at the TV screen. Uh, what I did, uh, one of the things that I liked to play with that I found quite fascinating was um, this this idea of video uh, of kind of a reverse of video feedback. What I did is I would find a surveillance camera somewhere and then tune a television receiver to the surveillance camera and wave the television receiver back and forth in the room while picking up the signal from the surveillance camera. And of course it did video feedback, but in a much different way. What I was doing here is instead of moving the camera around at a fixed television, I was moving a television around at a fixed camera. And so the camera was at a fixed location, and I would move this, um, this television receiver around and, and uh, explore the space with the television receiver. So, uh, and then I would do a long exposure photograph with another camera at the same time and the other camera would pick this, this signal up. So you can see there's light trails made from the TV being moved back and forth. Uh, the television would, would glow more brilliantly when it was in view of the surveillance camera and less brilliantly when it was outside the view. And these are exposures, uh, traces left uh, of a long exposure. And I'd use different colored filters uh, to pick out different sensitivities. So in red, this is HDR, high dynamic range metavision. So uh, in blue, we have the weak signals, in green, the medium strength signals, and in red, the very strong signals. These are three different levels of sensitivity that are captured in this HDR metavalograph. Metavalography is the uh, sensing of sensing, photographing, photographing, 
photographing, taking pictures of cameras, more or less. And, and so uh, what, what we had here, this is the photograph of the photograph. This is the metavalograph of the camera. And you can see here uh, from the metavalograph that uh, you can see the trace of the sight of the camera. It has a, there's a certain region of sight. So if I'm looking like this, you can see my vision is sweeping out here. This uh, device, so, so I had that television receivers uh, moving a TV screen around. It was quite heavy to lift the television and move it back and forth in, a, in front of the camera. And you typically want to do it in a dark space, so I'd go out late at night or something and set up a camera on a tripod to record on film the surveillance camera's trace, and then I'd move a television receiver back and forth in front of the surveillance camera to record its metavalography. And uh, here what I have is a... A uh, device that I built back in 1974, uh, which was a phenomenon amplifier, a phenomenological augmented reality amplifier. And this device received television signals and amplified them and presented them to a display. I had this crazy vision of a device that we could all have with us that was a, a television, a radio, a, a voice recorder, um, various, various things like that, music player a telephone, a computer, kind of all in one thing. And I kind of envisioned this sort of wearable computer that, that we'd all carry with us and would measure different things and sense different things. And so that's kind of what this is. And so this is kind of my childhood vision of how computing should be. Uh, on the left is what computers were like back then. And I noticed telephones were uh, this thing. I, I kind of envisioned this this merging, if you will, of telephone and calculator into something that would be a tool of artistic expression and social communication. And the idea that we could share our experiences in our everyday life through computation and computation, measurement, communication, computation, and so on. This is an early, when I, I, I was accepted at MIT and I brought this invention down to MIT and this is kind of what I brought with me is this wearable computer and in the World Wide Web in the early days of the web, I created what was the world's first photo sharing website. And sharing my existence and experiences in, in everyday life with the World Wide Web and the internet, and maybe in some sense a precursor of today's social media. And not without controversy, uh, it's created quite a stir of controversy. And uh, certainly, for example, this article written way back uh, in 1996 says that this wearable webcam goes too far and so in some days in some sense uh, what we see a lot now with Facebook and all these things is going too far so the device that I built uh, back in the 70s uh, would pick up television signals amplify them and feed them to an electric light bulb and so here is a surveillance camera these are some photographs from, from years ago, from my childhood. A surveillance camera with a light bulb being waved back and forth in front of the surveillance camera, and the light bulb is connected to an amplifier that's picking up the television signals and causing it video feedback. And you can see here as the lamp sweeps back and forth, this is a negative, the photographic negative. Uh, and you can see in areas of the negative where there's more light, they become darker. And you can see the sweeps that I took with the light bulb and the trajectory that's drawn. There's a little bit of delay between when the light bulb uh, comes in. So the sweep one, it comes along here and it's a little bit of a delay before it kicks in and then finally it kicks in and then it, it takes a little while to despawn. So there's a response as I come over sweep two again and then a despawnse. Sweep three, I come across this way. There's a response time from here to here and then there's a despawnse time from here to here and so on, back and forth. Here's the response delay, here's the despawnse delay coming sweep back this way, response delay, despawnse delay, and so on as I'm sweeping that lamp back and forth, sort of painting out, if you will, the light. And the word photography, in fact, <clears throat> is a Greek word uh, from photos, which means light, and graphy, which means painting or drawing. So the word photography 
is a Greek word which in English means light painting or light drawing. And in some sense, this kind of captures the true essence of photography because in a sense what I'm doing is using the light to draw a picture of the camera's capacity to see. Here is a light bulb. Now the light bulb has to glow a little bit to start the feedback process, so I would amplify it so much that it would pick up noise or anything and glow a little bit of a, red a dull red glow. And then as the lamp came into field of view of the camera, it would glow more brilliantly. This is a sequence of animation, some of these pictures in sequence. And here uh, is a picture of the light bulb with the camera. And as I move the light bulb back and forth in the field of view of the camera, it draws out or traces out its path or its locus. This picture was taken a little more recently at MetaVision with my co-founder um, uh, Raymond Lowe here. And he, going back to my childhood, here's a picture of the uh, an array of 35 electric lights. I made this thing called the Sequential Wave and Printing Machine, SWIM. With, and this one had 35 electric lights on a stick, waved back and forth that collects and shows the meta vision of the camera. And you can see the camera's capacity to see. Here is an animation or a sequence. And if, at the time, this is kind of a form of visual art, a form of uh, a hobby of mine to sort of photograph the world and how it responds MetaVision, uh, and it was only later that we realized that this was, you know, a 70 million, 75 million dollar idea to kind of create this augmented reality overlays on top of the world, and you can see that the the utility in being able to overlay information on top of the world around us. Here's a photograph of radio waves, radar. Here's another example. There's a surveillance camera here. This is a long exposure photograph. Of, uh, this is with LEDs, with an array of LEDs, a sequential wave and printing machine made out of LEDs. And the eyeglasses I'm wearing there are the Meta Pro eyeglasses. And so you can see again here, I'm taking a row of LEDs. There's a surveillance camera in the hallway here. And I'm taking a row of LEDs and I'm taking a long exposure photograph of that row of LEDs being moved in front of the camera. And they're sequentialized so that uh, it, the lights glow more brilliantly when they're in view of the surveillance camera than when they don't. And this is the game video feedback. Here's a, a couple more examples. A photograph of a surveillance camera. And here is a photograph uh, in the uh, men's room uh, near my uh, uh, lab. There's three faucets there and the faucets have small cameras in them which are uh, usually linear array of 1024 pixels and they're invisible in the sense that they're infrared cameras that respond to the infrared structured light source that measures whether senses hands under the faucet and normally we do not get to see this world but now what we have is is a glimpse into this otherwise invisible world here's a smart city street light a smart street light here uh, has a camera in it and this is a photograph of the camera's capacity to see as the camera zooms in and pans across so what happens here is the camera recognizes uh, that there's somebody there and it zooms it in and pans across and the light brightens uh, in response to movement. So these are the new kind of street lights that you see throughout entire cities that use cameras and computer vision to automatically sense when people are present and brighten up and increase the brightness when people are present so they save energy because the light is dim when there's nobody around. There just has to be enough light for the camera to work. Uh, but then when people come into field of view, there's a bubble of light that travels along with the person. So maybe two or three lights ahead and one light behind the person riding a bicycle or walking lights up. And when there's a car, it's moving faster. So maybe you go five lights ahead and two lights behind a little bubble of light that moves along with the person. So this is the relationship between smart people, smart cities, smart worlds, as I said before. A car is just an example of loose-fitting clothing. A bicycle is also the cyborg technology. And so cars, bicycles, clothing are examples of technologies that become part of us. And we live in the smart city. And so we will see a lot of this technology and intelligent image processing. We did the same thing with human vision. So here we have uh, the human vision. So we made a device that causes the human eye itself to function as both uh, 
a, a camera and uh, interactive uh, mechanism. So uh, here what we have is we have light, a light source that's swept in front of the, of the human eye uh, and we have response and despawns. This is a paper that my daughter presented when she was in high school. Uh, she and another student built a brain scanning device that measures metavalence of the human eye uh, and, and she presented this at the key, as the keynote address at a conference in Korea. Um, this is the interaxon muse. We're using the interaxon muse to pick up the brainwave data. And this is an ionograph, which is a metavalograph of the human eye itself. So this is the first time in human history, perhaps, that we've built an apparatus that causes the human eye itself directly to function as if it were a camera. And so these, although they're very crude pictures, you can see they bear the similarity to the metavalography that we saw earlier in the sense that there's, you can see the response time and the despawns time as this light source moves back and forth in front of the human eye. This is the apparatus that my, my daughter built when she was in high school together with uh, uh, another high school student. And there's a Brady chair there that holds the subject steady. A Brady stand, as you might remember from history, was the thing they used in early photography to hold people steady during long exposure photographs. This is, a, we'll call it a Brady chair for, for lack of a better term, but it simply allows the subject to rest the head in a fixed position. There's a chin rest up here on the apparatus, the head rest on the Brady chair, and so the head is fixtured in a particular position, and then this apparatus moves a smartphone back and forth across the field of view of the wearer and there's a flashing checkerboard there and it, it uses SSVEP, something called steady state visual evoked potentials to scan the brain and then it modulates that RGB LED here to show the amount of valence flux present basically to show how much vision is present and there's a camera over here to photograph that uh, thing sweeping by and here's the uh, photograph taken by the apparatus so as that light whips back and forth in front of the eye uh, it, it bobs up and down in brightness and, and traces out the, the, the valence flux. Here is a traditional Brady stand that was used in early photography to hold people steady during long exposure photographs, and we're sort of borrowing from that idea. We'll learn about long exposure photography in this course uh, and about exposure integration and HDR and many other things like that. Here is a game that we made. Uh, <coughs> there's four players sitting around this SSVEP, Steady State Visual Evoked Potentials device. Uh, this is what the device looks like. It's a little robot that moves a smartphone back and forth and everybody looks at it. And whoever has the most visual acuity looking at it, it draws that towards the person with the most visual acuity. There are four players here. <clears throat> and uh, you can see here my daughter won that competition very quickly. For some reason, which we're trying to study, her visual acuity is, is immense. If there's a car driving by late at night with dark windows, she'll often recognize all the people in the car quickly as it whizzes by. And most of us can't even see how many people are in the car, but she'll be able to name who is in the car sometimes if she happens to have met these people before. Sometimes she'll see somebody once and then a year later they'll be driving by in a car late at night with dark windows and she'll recognize the person or so immense visual acuity, so she seems to be able to pull that planchette uh, towards her, so she seemed to win that game repeatedly, a game of visual attention and visual focus. And so here is how the game works, as you look at that flashing checkerboard pattern, and whoever has the strongest SSVEP, steady state visual evoke potentials, pulls the planchette across to them based on that robot. Here's another example that we did. We took the world's first pictures of, uh, of the brain, reading out the brain uh, from the, the human eye. We have here uh, in the upper left, we've got a secret image, uh, a shape, a very simple shape. And in the lower left, we've got what we read out of the brain uh, using this apparatus. And over on the upper right, we've got another example of a secret image. And in the lower right, we have a, what we read out of the brain. And you can see, although it's crude and vague, you can see there's a similarity here between what we see, what the brain, what we're looking at, and what we read out of the brain. Uh, here is another example. <clears throat> um, in this example, we have 
a mind reading headset and we're looking at a picture here which is a no cameras allowed sign and what we have over there uh, on the right is what we read out of the brain so we can actually recognize that no cameras allowed so this is a photograph that was taken without using a camera just using the human eye itself so it's kind of fun we're a little bit playful here no photography no cameras allowed but we still take a picture so it's kind of fun when the eye itself becomes a camera. This is a uh, game that we made, uh, a Ouija board, in which the characters are all flashing at different uh, frequencies, different speeds, and you focus and concentrate on one of them using SSVEP, steady state visual vote potentials. And this way of imaging allows us to create a BCI. For example, we're doing uh, the, the we, we built years and years ago, we made a wheelchair that uh, uh, for, for uh, paraplegics, quadriplegics, that is driven by uh, brain control and other kinds of devices like the ITAP. And so this is a, a fun example. Here we've got, uh, uh, we decided, are we going for sushi tonight? And we all put the Ouija board here and we did this. And then we also did something called Ouija Green, where we had the terms end user license agreement. We decided we'd summon the spirits of the dead to be bound by the terms and conditions of an end user license agreement which more, more or less we had everybody looking at this and, and like a virtual planchette to pull around. So it's kind of a fun, silly game. It's like this Parker Brothers game called Ouija. And it's sort of a fun, playful. We presented this work at the IEEE uh, Games Conference. So this is a new kind of gaming uh, using brainwaves and imaging to sense and understand the world. And we decided, yes, we're going to go for sushi. Here's another example of mind over motor. We call this mind over motor. What we have here is a system in which we use the brain to control the state of the motor. And um, so mind over motor, we, we have brain waves controlling the motor. And uh, you can see here that uh, the motor also has a sequential wave and printing machine on it. Uh, to show so we can see the electromagnetic fields inside the motor with the swim. And here's the brain controlled wheelchair using the Muse. Again, the mind is controlling the motor and we've also got a swim on there. And we're doing all kinds of interesting experiments using biofeedback and meditation. Uh, one of the projects that we're doing called Jobbing on the Sleep is the opposite or reciprocal of sleeping on the job. Jobbing on the sleep is using the subconscious mind to perform useful work. So by meditation, uh, we're able to design electric motors and electric circuits by looking at the swim and using biofeedback to optimize the parameters of the motor using the po lateral thinking power of the human mind. So lots of fun, crazy things. This is another sequential wave and printing machine here. This is showing gravitational waves using a, a rotational swim like the swim motor. Uh, but it rotates and it also uh, moves up and down. So it's a polar coordinates sequential wave and printing machine, a swim in polar coordinates. And what we see here is a gravitational wave. So this is the sequential wave and printing machine running with gravitational waves. And uh, this is something that's, uh, that's really excited me. You know, it's a lot of fun. You can see my brain waves bouncing up and down when I'm talking about this. Uh, So here we have the gravitational waves. Uh, this is something that I find really exciting. So you can see my brain activity bouncing up and down while I'm talking about this and uh, uh, change in brain activity. And uh, it's quite a fun and interesting thing to watch and see and understand, to be able to see these waves and understand them and really understand the world we're living in. And this is the sequential wave and printing machine showing a meta wave function of a microphone. So there's a microphone here, and what we're seeing is its meta valence wave function, its capacity to listen. So we're seeing here uh, the capacity of a microphone to pick up sound waves, and what we're seeing there is is this this what we call the meta valence wave function, and this function uh, times its complex conjugate. Mm -hmm. um, a Hilbert transform gives you a, uh, 
a sense of, of the strength of the signal, you notice the amplitude of this metavalence wave function is higher over closer to the microphone at the one side of the room and at the other side of the room further from the microphone. Uh, so for right, right over here close to the microphone it's strong and further from the microphone it's weaker in amplitude. And so this is again the uh, example of a sitting wave. The metavalence wave function of the microphone is, is itself a sitting wave. Here is a listening device concealed in the nose of a stuffed, cute little stuffy. A lot of times you have hidden cameras and hidden microphones inside these stuffed animals. And I just thought it was kind of funny to have this cute little stuffed animal with a hidden microphone inside its nose. And here is a wrist-worn metavalence wave function, metavalography, uh, sensing um, the valence flux coming from that listening device. And we can see again the sound waves there, actually not the sound waves, but the capacity for the sound waves to exist. And again the function uh, over, over close, you know, close to the nose there, it's quite strong, and then as we move further away from the, the nose, the wave function, it starts out really, really big, and then gets smaller as we move away. Here is uh, my office in Silicon Valley, and just turn off the FNIR's data for a moment. Here in my, my office I've got a violin on my desk that's played with a little robotic mechanism I built to keep the violin playing continuously. And I've got the sound waves from the violin there moving across. This uh, is that one of those desks that we made out of a single slab of solid redwood with a little rail that rides along it with a sequential wave and printing machine. And then uh, uh, we made this nice little table out of matching uh, similar redwood with a glass top on it so it's kind of nice because you can see the reflections of the waves there see the reflections of the waves in the window here so this is definitely not computer graphics this is real reality what we call xr extended reality and we can see here the wave function of the violin next slide here shows a little later at night when it's a little darker <coughs> we have the violin with the sound waves and we have kind of an interactive uh, XR eyeglass experience where we can interact with these waveforms and kind of sculpt and touch and hold on to the waveforms in this world, in this sort of computer generated world that we've, we have here. There's another example here of this kind of reality. Here uh, we have the waves interactively. <clears throat> I can adjust the various harmonic components of the waves with this Pascal Fourier synthesizer as, a, as an input. And here is kind of direct interaction with the waves through the MetaVision eyeglass. Here's another example. I've got my ulnar nerve uh, and I've got electricity flowing down my ulnar nerve, which I can see. Uh, the voltages are indicated here, which are varied, you know, RHG full recruitment, 265 volts, starting out and increases the voltage gradually up to about 400, and then back down to 100 and something. And so that wave travels along my ulnar nerve. It's a combined neuron action potential, CNAP. And here we have it on the swim. <clears throat> so I'm able to swim out and see the electricity flowing in my ulnar nerve along here. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time in the Stanford uh, cadaver lab practicing surgical procedures and developing new surgical procedures and collaborating with people who have developed new surgical procedures. So again, we're using the SWIM to understand and spatialize and see and understand how we might do surgical procedures using this kind of overlay technology. Here I'm doing a surgical procedure, practicing on a cadaver, uh, on an arm, uh, practicing a carpal tunnel surgery, a new innovative carpal tunnel surgery, which is done using augmented reality overlay, <coughs> where we explore using sonar 
and use sonar to guide the uh, surgical instrumentation. So it just goes, everything passes through a small pinprick hole so it doesn't leave any scar or mark or anything. There's no cutting in to do the surgery. It's all passing through a very small opening with a needle to insert the surgical instruments. <coughs> so here uh, I have, uh, in this example, what we're showing is the interplay between radio waves and brain waves. And so we see these different waves and how they interact with one another. This is uh, a smartphone that I built uh, as a fun prototype. And we're seeing here the electromagnetic radio waves coming from the smartphone. And we're able to see and interact with these waves and see and understand. This is uh, down in the lower right is a, a lock-in amplifier. This is one of the, the world's most advanced lock-in amplifiers that we built in collaboration between Man Lab and Sun Yat-sen University. And the lock-in amplifier is the world's first lock-in amplifier that will aggregate multiple harmonics of, of a waveform. Again, we can see and grasp and touch and directly interact with the technology. This is a, an XY plotter. And what we have here is two transducers, two ultrasonic transducers, and a photograph of their interference pattern. Here we see that as we vary the spacing between the transducers, we have a sequence of photographs which we can animate here. And this allows us to see and understand the effects of spacing on the transducers with the interference pattern that is generated in the metavalence wave function. Here we have two microphones and a photograph that shows the interference pattern between the metavalence wave functions of these microphones. And down below I've got that lock-in amplifier that, uh, that we built for this purpose and directly above the lock-in amplifier is a cathode ray oscillograph, an oscilloscope from the 1970s which shows an XY plot showing basically real versus imaginary, that is the argon plane, the complex plane traced out on the oscillograph, which we see uh, from the lock-in amplifier so that we can actually see and understand the interference pattern. Here is a metavalence wave function of a single microphone showing a defect. The microphone is damaged in one spot, and you can see that defect quite readily in the metavalence wave function of that microphone. So we will talk in this course. We're going to learn a lot about technologies that become part of us about wearables, about uh, smart clothing, implantable computers, smart clothing, eyeglasses, shoes, uh, smart cars, self-driving vehicles, uh, smart cities, all these technologies that we interact with and intelligent image processing that is inherent in, in these technologies. So here again is an example of a metavalence wave function of a microphone and this is using this as an educational tool. And these examples, these are examples of something, I coined the term natural user interface, NUI. And if you look at the relationship here, command line interface is what we had years and years ago. Graphical user interface is something we see a lot of today. And NUI natural user interface is direct and intuitive, something that we'll see in the future. I also refer to this as metaphor-free computing or reality user interface or direct user interfaces. And the idea here is that we have a meta, we, instead of a graphical user interface, instead of a trash can metaphor or instead of these desktop metaphors, we're getting rid of metaphors altogether and having a direct user interface with reality. So, the, so in the natural user interface context, we have reality uh, is sensors and effectors uh, kind of on the whole world. So we have uh, the, the world is part of a feedback loop, let's say, in which there's uh, senses and effectors. That's kind of reality. And then uh, we've got digital reality. Maybe over the last uh, 4,500 years or so, we've had digital computing 
things, technologies like the abacus and sort of numerical computing, numerical thinking, discrete quantized thinking. It's hard to pin that down exactly. Uh, and then in today, today we have the multimediated world, multimediated reality as part of the feedback loop. All reality is what we call this, all forms of reality. So implicit in a lot of this is a, a conceptualization that uh, Marvin Minsky, who's the father of AI and machine learning, and Ray Kurzweil, the chief engineer of Google, and myself, the three of us, came up with this concept uh, of humanistic intelligence, uh, sort of built on some of my earlier work from, the, from 1998. In 2013, we built uh, further on this work the idea of humanistic intelligence is intelligence that arises be, be, because of the human being in the feedback loop of a computational process where the human and the computer are inextricably intertwined. So we have a wearable computing system that embodies HI and becomes so technologically advanced in this synergy that the, intel, it, the intelligence of the computer matches our own biological brain. Uh, together, something much more powerful emerges from this synergy that gives rise to superhuman intelligence within a single sort of cyborg being, if you will. So there's this idea of AI. It's really human in the loop AI. Um, uh, what many people now call explainable AI or understandable AI or comprehensible AI uh, is this idea of, of feedback-based AI uh, and AI in the feedback loop of the computational process, HI is a very fundamental concept. And one way to look at it is as, as if it's a control system. So the human and the machine are uh, connected in some way through these uh, informatic flow paths, signal flow paths. We can think of this as there's, there's signal flow paths. A human has senses and effectors, and machines have sensors and actuators. And together, in, in, in synergy, the, the, that defines four signal flow paths, and there's two more, which is the when we sense the machine, that's uh, observability, and when the machine senses us, that's controllability. Sometimes when we're being watched, we call that surveillance, the French word oversight. And when we're watching, we call that surveillance. And we can think of it in this context, that there's a closed loop feedback. If you need this balance between these two, if you have, uh, in some sense, valence is at the core of humanistic intelligence. Surveillance and surveillance define uh, humanistic intelligence feedback loop. Machines of malice, you know, often give us less feedback, less uh, sense of, of understanding them. And this is where a lot, of H, a lot of AI can give us these machines of malice. As a fun little joke, I made a light switch in my office, which uh, is push you push it once to turn it on and then you push it again to turn it off and there's a random three to five second delay with a 10% a packet loss so it works about 90% of the time to mimic this sort of modern technology that people find so frustrating. So surveillance and surveillance. Surveillance is when we're being sensed and, and surveillance is when we're sensing. Uh, examples of surveillance-based technologies are this sort of neck-worn camera system that I created back in 1998. Microsoft uh, popularized that in 2004, and Momodo later brought this into a sort of very sleek and slender form factor. <coughs> so surveillance is a watch kept over someone or something, especially over a suspect or a prisoner. The suspects were under police surveillance. Notice the word over is repeated there, and under, so it's got something to do with over and under. We often talk about over and under the valence as a valence. And what we have is that this idea is that surveillance means oversight. Surveillance is, is watching from above. My six-year-old daughter made this little drawing there. We've got surveillance is when we're being watched, and surveillance is when we're doing the watching. Think of this, uh, one way to look at this is to consider the fractal self-similar nature of humanistic intelligence. The human mind and body are connected through efferent and afferent nerves. That is to say, uh, afferent nerves uh, feed the brain with information about what's happening in the body, and efferent nerves give us a way to, for the brain to control the body. And so you can think of the mind and body are connected through this efferent and afferent nerve feedback loop. 
and that produces a continuous feedback loop, closed loop feedback. But there's a fractal nature. If we look at the Hue machine, the human machine interface, we can think of it as an interaction between human and machine, where the the, the human sense is picked up from the machine and the machine has sensors that pick up from the human. So this interplay between senses and sensors is at the heart of this Hue machine. And if you look here, the structure of it is such that the, the human, you can see it's just duplicated into here. So I've just scaled down this human uh, uh, into this space here and the human the human is part of this machine, is sensing with the machine feedback. So you can see there's a kind of self-similar, almost fractal nature, especially if we look at this one more layer. Now let's look at multiple human machines, multiple such cyborgs, if you will. So individual humans, the feedback loop is then part of the human machine, the technologies that become part of us. And then again, that piece goes in into the multiple feedback loops of, of multiple people. And so we have a smart city, which is watching us through its surveillance infrastructure. And we also become aware of the smart city through the surveillance. So you can see here this fractal self-similar nature of HI requires both surveillance and surveillance. And it's out of balance if it has surveillance only. So a society with uh, oversight only is an oversight on our part. We should double entendre the why we use the word surveillance rather than oversight, because oversight has a double meaning. But what you have here is that you've got this feedback loop uh, that that gives a that is embodied or instantiated in the fractal self-similar nature. And we have technologies that become part of us. So again, coming back to this idea of surveillance and surveillance, we kind of need both of these valences operating in parallel just one of them only creates a broken feedback loop. So again, coming back to the fractal self-similar nature of HI, you can see that we've got minds, multiple people. We've got selves, multiple selves. We've got selves and technology. We've got selves and society. We've got society in the city. And then we've got global cities. So this can extend uh, inside the mind. There's all kinds of feedback loops. And so the mind itself is composed of many feedback loops. The mind and body form a feedback loop. Multiple people form this feedback loop. And in the society, the selves in society form these feedback loops. And society in the city forms this feedback loop. And finally, multiple cities all over the world are connected in this oversight, undersight pattern. So, so we have this fractal self-similar nature. Many of these technologies are... Uh, of this sort. A car, for example, is a perfect example of a technology like this. Uh, you'll see in a parking lot when, the, when the, the one car bumps into another car, people say, oh, you, you, you hit me. They don't say, your car hit my car. So we think of the car as part of ourselves. Uh, the person also is, is so we, we, have, we have here the, 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 the human body. Uh, to start with, at this smallest scale, we've got these three axes bits, atoms, and genes. Uh, so the bit is the smallest unit of information. Atom is a Greek word that means non-divisible. A in front of something means not, and tom means divide in Greek. So atom means that which is not divided. I'm using the word at atom here in the classical Greek sense of that which is non-divisible, perhaps subatomic atomic particles, quarks, and pi mesons, or whatever that case may be. Uh, we have at the origin here the smallest unit of physical space, and then we move outwards from that unit of physical space. So we have, we start anywhere along this axis, like we have, say, car, for example. You can go outwards to building, street, neighborhood, city, province, country, earth, universe. And we can go inwards from car to motorcycle to bicycle to wheelchair to rollerblades to clothing to the human body itself, to the organs inside the body, to cellular biology. So as we move from the origin of, say, bits, atoms, and genes, the smallest unit, genes are the smallest unit of humanness, and then beams, memes, and so on. As we move outwards on the human axis, we get the social sciences. As we move outwards on the 
uh, physical space, we go, we have geography and physical sciences, and as we move on the informatics space, we have computer science. So we have these three axes, and you can see that there's a, there's a, a, a continuous scale here. What is the technology that we consider part of us? How far along that axis do we need to go to consider part of us? There's that famous joke that somebody said, now, uh, beam me up, Scotty. And then he said, now beam up my clothes. That wasn't very funny. And implicit in that joke is the idea that some of what we have around us is considered part of us. We kind of expect our clothing to be part of us. We don't expect this shelf behind me, if I jumped into some science fiction narrative with a time machine or a space machine, I wouldn't expect this whole shelf to come with me or the building, but I might expect my clothes to come with me. So what, what, that which we regard as part of ourselves is the technology that becomes part of us, like riding a bicycle after a while, you, you feel you become part of the machine. As Manfred Kleins often said, he's the one who coined the term cyborg, and his favorite example was somebody riding a bicycle. So that is an example of a technology that becomes part of us. So is a car to some extent. And so these technologies form this continuum of physical scales on the physical axis, alpha for atom, because it's a Greek word, so we'll use the Greek letter alpha to represent this axis. Bits we're representing by the word beta, and genes we're representing by the, by the, by the variable gamma. So alpha, beta, gamma form these three axes that form the space. On the, on the physical space, you've got little data, such as blockchain distributed technologies, and then you've got big data, which is centralized. On the social political scale, you've got surveillance uh, at the smaller scales and surveillance at the larger scale. You've got individual, couple, family, team, community, corporation, nation, world government, and they even have the law of outer space. So we have this entire space carved up in this way, and this is kind of how I come to understand this space. And if you look historically or classically, the Areas of study have been more in the outwards, like the environment is that which surrounds us. It's shown in green here. There's a lot of work on environmentalism and this sort of uh, environmental studies and so on. But what is over here, I call it the environment. It's that which is not the environment, us ourselves. And likewise, uh, in big data, there's tons and tons of work on big data, but very little on work on little data until recently, blockchain, things like that. And again, there's a lot of surveillance. There's surveillance studies. The word surveillance is like 200 years old. Uh, and surveillance is a relatively new concept. If you search that up, you'll find a lot of new work, but it's new. So what I brought, my contribution in some sense, was to create this thinking near the origin. That is to say, to think about the environment and environmentalism, to think about surveillance and to think about little data and to bring these three things together. So again, I said technology that becomes part of us, clothing, you know, if you, if you were to travel in a time machine or a space machine, you would expect your clothes to come with you. So clothing, we expect that to be, become part of us. Uh, and the car analogy, you know, you hit me with, with the car. So these are just two examples of technologies that become part of us. And that's kind of what I want to think about a little bit here. The environment is that which surrounds us and the environment is us ourselves. And clothing defines the boundary between the environment and the environment. Sometimes clothing is necessary to survival, like if you're in outer space or something, this uh, environmentalism becomes uh, super important, environment versus environment. Here we have uh, one of these water walking balls. You know, you can walk on water when you're inside this ball. And the ball forms kind of a little social bubble, if you will. We brought this to the park and we're saying, okay, how do we practice social distancing? Well, let's stay six feet apart. Let's take a ball that's six feet in diameter, put everybody in, in a little ball of their own, and then they will stay six feet apart. And so this is a perfect metaphor for the environment and the environment. If I draw this on the number line or a Venn diagram or something, we have a, a, a ball of, of, of radius, you know, roughly one meter. And so it's about two meters in diameter. And so this ball that's one meter in diameter defines the environment, and the environment is everything else around that ball. Environmentalism 
uh, is the interplay between the environment and the environment. Environmentalism is human-centered. <clears throat> so again, to show this in terms of a, a, a diagram, the environment is that which surrounds us and the environment is us ourselves. And as I said earlier when I talked about the example, now beam up my clothes, Scotty, that wasn't very funny. I think it's pretty sure to say that the boundary between the environment and the environment, i.e. our clothing, uh, should be considered part of us. So that's why I've shown the environment as a dotted circle uh, and the environment as a solid circle because I want to emphasize or underscore the, the idea that the boundary between the environment and the environment, the border between the environment and the environment, i.e. our clothing, I want to emphasize that that boundary is part of the environment or ought to be considered to be part of the environment. So in this case, the ball itself uh, is part of the environment. Christine is in her ball here, her social bubble, and she would probably consider the ball to be her ball uh, rather than, the, than something that belongs to the park. Parks and, it's not part of parks and recreation property. So here's a little fun play. We, I notice people sometimes wear these spike necklaces at rock concerts and things like that, and they put these spike necklaces on their dogs and everything. And there's this kind of, uh, of thing, that, and we thought, well, what would happen as a sort of performance art if we made those a little longer? And here we have a little piece called the social distancer. And uh, here is a sonar equivalent, a wearable equivalent of the social distancer that's a virtual social distancer. It uses sonar rangefinders to measure distance and alerts the user if somebody gets too close. So we built this some time ago. Here's the social distancer connected to a head-up display with the ITAP and as a form of, of art and social commentary right in front of the art gallery there. Uh, here, here's the social distancer at a public park and here is the social distancer close-up showing the design of this <clears throat> and there are pairs of sonar rangefinders. There's 12 of them. It's like a clock face and it shows you your social distance. It's using the metaphor from in movies when you say, oh, there's somebody at your seven o'clock position you know, and the guy shoots back and drops the guy who's trying to shoot him. And so you, people use a clock face as a metaphor to say where someone's coming in from. So we've numbered these from one to 12. So at the one o'clock position, you've got, well, 12 o'clock is straight ahead, six o'clock is what's right behind you, and so on. Uh, <coughs> and here's a little app that we wrote, environment. And so the wearable computer display output. Again, I want to emphasize these three areas, self and technology, self and society, and self and the environment. Self and technology is my own health, how I'm doing, my overlays, my stats. Uh, again, if I come back to my uh, blueberry data, you know, my this is my brain wave data um, uh, above that we saw earlier, uh, a brain state, FNIRS data. It shows my physical, uh, internal physical, affective, and mental health. And then we've got our social health, which is affect, self, and society. And then we've got the environmental health, like the noise, the sound levels, what's around you. Again, this eyeglass that I'm wearing, it has the FNIRS uh, data from the brain. And it also has a, a imaging system that captures that which is around us. And we see the interplay between that which is us, the environment, and that which is around us, the environment, and how machine learning can be used to correlate or in, in train this, this various information. We started a Marshall McLuhan Center working group called Privalence. Privalence is the interplay between privacy, surveillance, and surveillance. Uh, on equivalence, which is surveillance, surveillance, equilibrium, covidized surveillance, and dark surveillance. And uh, this is myself, Ron McEwen from the iSchool, David Naylor, former president of University of Toronto, very famous for the Naylor Report in Medicine, John Griffiths, Psychiatry, CAMH, uh, Christian Boss, uh, Techno Science Research Unit, Amir, Amir Adnan Ali, Engineering, Beth Coleman from UTM. So a bunch of us kind of got together and formed this uh, McLuhan working group. Now, a lot of this uh, realities that we talk about, we see virtual reality, augmented reality, and uh, Charles Wyckoff and I coined the term X-reality. And we can think of uh, 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 Milgram also looked at, at reality as a, as a, as a, as an, as a variable uh, mixed reality. We can think of as a, as a mixer, sort of like we have two record players here, turntables, and I've got the earth or the world on one turntable, which is reality, and I've got uh, 
a laser disc on the other uh, turntable. This is just a metaphor, of course, because we've got a video laser disc on an audio turntable. But my point here is that we've got this world where we have this crossfader, like a stereo disco party mixer, that allows us to crossfade between the real world and the virtual world. And this is what we often see is reality, augmented reality, augmented virtuality, and virtual reality. And we can conceptualize these things as a continuum between reality and virtuality. But my point of view is that this system fails to account for technologies that modify our reality. Many technologies don't just add something to our reality, but they modify how we see and understand the world. Any modern technology, like even comp computation, a camera system, a camera phone, changes how we see the world. So we have mediated reality, or we call XY reality. We have here uh, augmented reality. Uh, on the x-axis, we've got this, this uh, sort of x-reality slider. And on the y-axis, we've got the degree of modification of the reality. And this accounts for things like the augmented reality welding helmet, which diminishes our reality at times. It can be diminished, not just uh, augmented, but we can tame down the electric arc and see a dynamic range of more than 100 million to one. It helps us see and understand the world better. And we've got quantigraphic reality intelligence. Uh, this is early uh, prototype of a, a self-sensing. You know, me measuring our physiologicals. I used to have my heart respiration waveform, all these different phenomena measured and sensed and quantified. Uh, and I called it quantigraphic self-sensing. Uh, I brought this material to the uh, wired offices in San Francisco, showed it to uh, Kevin Kelly many, many years ago, and he referred to it as quantified self. So one thing is sensory attenuation technologies, like dark sunglasses to help you see better, or a dark welding helmet. These are Sensory attenuation is not accounted for in VR, AR, phenomenological reality, XR, XY reality, me, mix, mediated reality, mixed reality, or any of these other realities. So like earplugs, sunglasses, all these technologies, a sensory deprivation tank and sensory reprivation, as we call it, immersivity. We made an underwater virtual reality device to help people sort of find their way, safe swim project, and so on. All of these need a new way of thinking. Virtual reality was uh, came up in 1938. Uh, and now it's time, more recently, to have a new conceptualization of reality. So my take on reality is that the origin, or the zero, is not reality itself, uh, but rather the origin is nothingness. So here's a float tank, a sensory deprivation float tank, and that's what I think the origin is. Uh, this is actually a, a, a mediated reality float tank, multi-mediated reality intelligence float tank. We've published a number of papers on this concept, but the origin is zero here. This is the origin. And so if we think of the immersivity or immersive submersive reality as kind of a, a, a origin, first create totally total sensory nothingness and then introduce multimedia reality content on top of that nothingness. And if we look at that, this gives us a new graph. And at the origin, we've got absolutely nothing, which is complete sensory uh, shutout. So the sensory uh, float tank has uh, symbolized what's at the origin. And then on one axis, we have reality. Let's call that the x-axis across. How much reality do we allow or introduce into that environment? And then the other axis is virtuality. How much virtuality do we put in there? And then augmentation is sort of the, the somewhere between uh, reality and virtuality along that axis. And then we have many, many other axes. Imaginality, lucid dream machine. I built a, a machine to record my dreams. Uh, lucid dreaming, interaction, and so on. Digital reality, quantization of reality, undigital reality, which is to use HDR vision to be able to get an unquantized view of reality, for example. We have immersivity, uh, which is the, under, the, the various underwater sensors. We've got kinovalence, wearable sensing, metavalence, metavision. So we have many different axes that come out of this origin. So this is kind of what we wrote about all reality in these research papers. So if you want to learn about that concept of all reality. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about some fun stuff. 
that's maybe not too related to the course. When I went to Stanford University, one of the things I noticed is you see about uh, 50 people walking across campus in their bathing suits all heading to the fountain. And so the Stanford tradition was hopping in the fountain. People said fountain hopping is one of those wacky Stanford traditions that in aggregate makes us who we are uh, in this article called Fountains of Youth. And so one of the challenges we always had that was fun was to deadhead the two tallest jets in, at, at Stanford. So I did a lot of things called head games where I made a graph of flow versus uh, pressure. Flow, uh, a flow is a function of pressure or you know you can think of Thevenin and Norton equivalents of voltage and amperage and we often use those as metaphors for uh, um, flow in pipes. And so we tried to deadhead the fountain and feel uh, intuitively and understand that principle of deadheading and then feel, you can actually feel the drop in head when you come almost deadheaded. It's quite hard to deadhead it because you're coming down on that water jet and it throws your hand out either way and it's a real challenge. And so a lot of people can't deadhead that. So it was always a fun challenge to try and do so. So what I tried to do is dead, uh, first getting to Stanford, the first thing I tried to do is deadhead the two tallest jets in Tanner Fountain, one in each hand simultaneously. And so that was, that was one thing that we tried to do. And then, and I was trying to deadhead all four of them. Yeah, where the pressure can be alleviated, right? So that was a total deadhead. And so that was kind of a thing. And then I built this little robot that does evasive maneuvers. And you try and deadhead that to add a new challenge to it. So this is a, a robot. Uh, they kind of wrestle with the robot and try and deadhead that jet. Uh, another one of my inventions is the hydrolophone, the world's first uh, true water instrument, which is a underwater pipe organ and it's an underwater musical instrument that was featured at the water exhibit at the Royal Ontario Museum. Here's what it sounds like. We had it at the... Uh... brought it to the Beaches Jazz Festival. Here's the world's largest hydrolophone at the Ontario Science Centre, the main centrepiece. Uh, <coughs> they put out a call for artists and, and they took in uh, about 240 uh, artists and designers from around the world, submitted applications and then uh, our, uh, they chose the top uh, 40 of those and had them reviewed and then they brought the top 10 of us in for, uh, to bring and show, showcase a kind of little maquette, a little mock-up of what this thing would be like and then we demonstrated it to them and they they loved it so it became the main centerpiece out in front of the Ontario Science Centre. In many ways Ontario is the water capital of of the world. Um, we see uh, if you if you think about this uh, what are we known for? The Great Lakes hold about 70 or 80 percent of North America's freshwater and they're all in Ontario uh, they're, uh, in the U.S., they're across a couple of different, a few different states, so it's unlikely they're all going to get together and agree. But here in Ontario, we sort of, quote, own, unquote, uh, the, the, the water. And, and so Lake Ontario, even in name, symbolizes, if you will, the world's epicenter of fresh water. And if uh, water is the new oil, then Ontario is the new Saudi Arabia in some sense. And if we think of it that way, Toronto is kind of an epicenter of Ontario, so Toronto could be known as the water capital of the world. And so this is kind of one of my 
uh, things that I'm thinking about here. This is the world's largest hydrolophone. Flash page and interactive sort of underwater musical instrument. This is a water over internet protocol. So this idea here is I, I got the idea from those sort of things that you push your hand against a, a bunch of pins, metal pins, and it puts an imprint of your hand out the other side. I thought what would happen if those pins reached all the way across the earth and came out the other side of the earth so that you put your hand, press your hand down here and it pops out in China. And then I did that with water jets. So you put your hand, you press your hand here, and then elsewhere it pops up that, that pattern. The water jets each respond in a way so that you convey or understand or convey this, this conceptualization. And there's my daughter uh, uh, in her childhood when she was asked, oh, how does this thing work? You know, she did this presentation at the YMCA conference, and uh, she wrote down this F equals C over 2 pi times the square root of A over VL, and she kind of chugged through that a little bit as a conceptualization to calculate L, which is the length of pipe that you need to cut to make this underwater pipe organ. Um, uh, we've had other people uh, mentored uh, of all ages, so we're kind of, there's a lot of outreach here we do. People of all ages are inspired by these inventions. This is my daughter would take her instrument to school and show it to all the other kids and have them play in the playground at recess or bring it in and showcase it and get people interested in science, get people interested in invention and playing and interacting with the world. Uh, she would take this thing apart and put it all back together herself. She knew, knew, knew how, to, how to assemble it. Um, my other daughter, Christina, when she was two years old, she could take this Nessie apart and clean it all out and put it all back together. And so there's this wonderful sort of uh, uh, innate natural, this NUI as I call it, the, the term I coined natural user interface, is about natural philosophy, which is, about, which is another name for physics. And the laws of physics form the interface. The inter user interface is based on physics. So here's an example of an NUI. When you block this water jet here, it makes the water spray out over there. And it's like uh, this is a little thing. I wrote a little caption for it. Try to stop me if you will. I'll keep on spraying, spraying still. I'm water still as glass, so block me, block me still, I pass. This is a little thing I wrote here, a little caption on there. Uh, and when you stop water from coming out of one place, it, it goes somewhere one. else. So when you stop water from coming out of here, it comes out over there. Cool. Hang on, but there's a pump there, right? Yeah, you can try it if you want. Okay. Block it there. This is higher than this. So you can see here, when you deadhead that water jet, it sprays out, uh, and so then... So maybe I can get your comments on it as an art piece, and then, and then I'll, I'll tell you how it works. <laughs> I'm warning you, it'll throw So here's another example. Uh, water over internet protocol. So I, I call this the hands across the water concept. Uh, touching water in one location makes it spray out in the other location and vice versa. So you could have a water fight with somebody in another city or another country. And so there's this kind of fun, playful interaction, very low pixel count, uh, simple sensing and meta sensing, but it's really a natural interaction or a natural user interface. Here's another example of hands across the water. You touch water in one place and it makes something happen in, in, in another place. 
Here's a simple example of two water transceivers. Uh, when you step on one jet here, it sprays water out the other jet and vice versa. And these can be mounted anywhere. I call that WOIP, Water Over Internet Protocol. So they can be mounted anywhere in different cities or different countries. So these are examples of this interaction. This is a lab I set up in Copenhagen uh, as, as a week-long kind of project there culminating in an underwater concert as, the, as this sort of uh, lab, water lab that we envisioned bringing this Ontario idea across to the rest of the world. And uh, we kind of envisioned this hydraulicos research vessel with, a, with an ice rink here to celebrate ice and then a, a pool here to celebrate water and a steam calliope to cele celebrate steam. Uh, H2O, by the way, does anybody know the difference between water and H2O? Well, in, in some sense, H2O is a, is a proper superset of water because H2O can be ice or water or steam. Uh, it doesn't specify what state of matter it's in, so it's kind of nice. So we created uh, this thing called H2 Orchestra which uses, I made an instrument out of slabs of ice that you strike with rubber mallets to play tones, and then we had a steam calliope, and then we had a hydrolophone, so we had these various H2O uh, states. Here's another project we did called the Safe Swim. Uh, in the Safe Swim, we used uh, underwater virtual reality to map out the beach at Ontario Place. Um, swim Op is Swim at Ontario Place. We're kind of taking the Ontario Place Beach, which is downtown Toronto's only beach, and we're, we're using this as a research uh, in environment to test out some of the underwater virtual or augmented or X reality, extended reality underwater to be able to see and understand. We had an overhead drone to map out hazards, and we identified and found hazards. We found a lot of sharp pieces of metal, located them in the, in the virtual world, and then we were able to swim out and tie ropes to them and I got uh, a, a bunch of volunteers from on land, dry land, to pull while we swam down and eased some of the weight off that and got these big huge hundreds of pounds of metal out of the out of the water, things that were very dangerous and sharp. So we did a lot of beach cleanup using this and we wrote a research paper in an IEEE conference uh, called Safe Swim. Here is the underwater uh, virtual reality headset called Mercivity and uh, making this map and then here is our Facebook page for Swim Op which is Swim at Ontario Place. We have about 196 members now who regularly swim year-round. We swim uh, summer or winter. Shorter swims of course in the winter just a few minutes only when it's uh, and we were featured recently on breakfast television and the host of the show actually came in for a swim with us and she said what do you do when it's minus 17 out? you go for a swim. <laughs> and that was kind of fun. And so to summarize, uh, I want to just say intelligent image processing, image sensing, meta sensing, comparometric equations, wearables, mental health, well-being, environmentalism, the transition from environmentalism to environmentalism, then transition from surveillance to valence, and new projects like brain sensing and imaging and brain imaging and all these fun things blueberryx.com. So thank you for attending my EC516 lectures and I hope that you've enjoyed this. What I'm trying to do, as I mentioned before, is create an authentic uh, learning environment, kind of like uh, my, what I learned my experience at MIT when I learned from Marvin Minsky, learned AI from the person who invented the field of AI, and learned robot vision from Bertolt Horn who invented robot vision. Hopefully uh, what I've tried to do here is just show you some of my inventions and some of my interests, some of the things that I'm really excited about and passionate about and knowledgeable on, so that hopefully if you find something of interest, let me know and we can delve deeper into it. Um, we will be starting Lab 1 with building a camera, a simple camera. I've, I've taught this to high school students, to elementary school students. It's really super easy to understand how to build a camera, and I want everybody to learn fundamental physics and fundamental 
knowledge in a very simple way so that we can start to understand advanced topics in a very simple way. Um, and uh, thank you for coming and uh, look forward to connecting with you shortly. In the next lectures we'll introduce Lab 1 and get started as individual labs and then we form lab groups once you get to know each other. And let me know in the comments and feedback. Send me email with ECE516 in the subject line and I'll respond immediately uh, with any uh, feedback that you can give or questions you have. Thank you.